cross for Greg Parks, who slams it in. Nick Bean has the rebound. Nick Bean behind the net. Top of your screen for Evans. Inside for Parks. Holding that disc. Here's McBean closing, shooting, and scoring! The Springfield Indians have won the Calder Cup! For the first time in 15 years! Hey, hey, what do you say? Springfield, the Calder Cup belongs to you! Welcome to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the voice of hockey legends. This is the classic hockey show for classic hockey fans. We celebrate the history of the game with stories told by the select few who actually lived it. Get ready for an all-access pass to the heart of the hockey universe. Episode 51 of the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast features Bruce Landon, a solid WHA goaltender with the New England Whalers, a Springfield hockey icon, and one of the most respected men in all of hockey. Following a successful junior career with the Ontario Hockey League's Peterborough Peets, Bruce was selected in the fourth round of the 1969 NHL Draft by the Los Angeles Kings. He played three seasons for the Kings minor league affiliate, the Springfield Kings, where he backed up future Hockey Hall of Famer Billy Smith as the Kings won the AHL's Calder Cup championship in 1971. In 1972, Landon signed with the upstart New England Whalers of the WHA and was the team's backup goaltender for five seasons. He paired with Al Smith to lead the Whalers to the inaugural WHA championship in 1973. Upon retiring from pro hockey in 1977, Bruce embarked on an amazing 40-year career in a variety of roles with Springfield AHL Hockey, most notably serving as GM of the Indians and co-owner of the Springfield Falcons. He managed the Indians franchise as it won improbable back-to-back Calder Cup championships in 1990 and 91 with two different NHL affiliations. Bruce was inducted into the AHL Hall of Fame in 2016. We'll discuss a lot about Bruce's days in Springfield, but it goes without saying that there would be no AHL hockey in Springfield without his heroic efforts to keep it alive. Bruce has a new book out, The Puck Stops Here, My Not-So-Minor League Hockey Life. Hockey fans will love the inside stories in the AHL and WHA. It's also a great reference for those interested in the business of hockey. Purchasing information for the book is in the show notes. All proceeds from the sale of the book will benefit the Tammy Jacobson Landon I Can Hear You Scholarship Fund at the Clark School for Hearing and Speech. Now, let's talk classic hockey with Bruce Landon. Well, we're thrilled to have our next guest. He's on the Mount Rushmore of Springfield hockey legends, to be sure. He was a Springfield King in the early 70s, went on to an excellent five-year career with the New England Whalers at WHA, helped them to the Avco Cup Championship in 1973. Later in hockey management, marketing, sales, ownership, everything but selling popcorn for the Springfield franchise in American Hockey League and eventually recognized as a member of the AHL Hall of Fame, goaltender Bruce Landon. Bruce, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks very much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be on the phone with you. Bruce, I read your book over the weekend. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a real snapshot. It's almost like the history of Springfield hockey from the the 70s through today. It was uh, really captivating. Your whole path through there, which we're going to just take a, a step aside for a minute I want to talk a little bit about your daughter, Tammy, who, of course, was the, as you've noted in the book, was the inspiration for the book. And if you could tell us a little bit about her as a person and how she inspired you to write this excellent book. 
Well, thank you, Mark. Yes, Tammy was definitely the inspiration for the book, and it all started quite innocently. Uh, shortly after I retired in May of 2017, Tammy and I were sitting enjoying a, a martini together, as we like to do, at, at my house, and uh, we just got I got sharing stories with her, things that she didn't know about my childhood and things she didn't know about uh, some of the things that went on in the hockey and the background of hockey. And she was a writer. She was a grant writer for Clark School for the Hearing and Speech and uh, an English major. And she just basically said, Dad, why don't you start writing some of that stuff down? And I said, why? She said, well, I think it's interesting. And I said, well, who would want to read? And she said, Dad, must we just start writing things <laughs> down? And she says, I'll edit it for you. I'll don't worry about grammar, don't worry about format, just start making notes. And so I did. Um, and uh, whenever I got frustrated, which was quite often because I'm not a writer, uh, I would call her up and she would say, just keep plugging away. Don't worry about it, keep plugging away. So I did, and it wasn't something I did every day. It was five minutes here, ten minutes there, and, and I started to sort of put a format together, sort of a chronological format of my life, basically, growing up in Canada and through my amateur and junior days and in the being drafted as a king and then the whalers and everything sort of went on in my career right through ownership as, as you've seen in the book. Mm-hmm. And, uh, then unfortunately Tammy, uh, it was diagnosed on May 11th, uh, 2018 with a very rare form of cancer. And I just basically lost it. for all intents and purposes. I just put the book on the back shelf. Didn't want to do it. I don't, and uh, my wife and I dealt, and my other daughter dealt with uh, dealing with the best we could with Tammy's sickness. But then mm-hmm. one day, shortly after one of her very strong chemo sessions, she talked to me, and so I, I visited with her. And uh, in typical Tammy fashion, she never was a woe is me type person, was always upbeat despite uh, her illness, and she knew how sick she was. And mm-hmm. She basically looked me straight in the eye and she said, I have one favor. And I said, what's that? Anything you want? And she said, I want you to promise me you will finish the book. And so that was sort of, uh, you know, inspiration to say, okay, you know, Dad, Bruce, you got to get going with this. And so I started working on it. And unfortunately, Tammy didn't get well and got worse, actually. And uh, I was sort of destined. I wanted to try and finish the book while she was still able to read the book. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. But I did finish the book three days before she passed. And, uh, you know, and she knew about it when she was drifting in and out of her last, mm-hmm. her last uh, hours. Uh, you know, I basically gave her a kiss on the forehead and said, hey, Dad, finish the book. And, you know, people believe it or not, but she actually looked at me with a little smile on her face, and uh, which led to the, uh, the scholarship I set up that is called the Tammy Jacobson Land, and I Can Hear You Now Scholarship Fund. So that's how it all started, Mark, and it was nothing I really, over my lifetime in hockey, had ever hockey players are all athletes when they're sitting around with a bunch of guys tell stories and I used to jokingly say when people would say something to me, I'd say, well, you'll have to read the book. There's no <laughs> intentions at that time of ever writing a book. So that's how it all came about. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of the end result. And I, I honestly think Tammy would be as well. She sure would. It was a very well-written book. It read very smoothly. And uh, I'm sure she'd be extremely proud of that as as you noted. It also comes at an interesting time in your life, Bruce, uh, not to get too psychological idea here, but also coincides with your retirement after a long and successful career in the in the pro rank. So I was wondering if the book kind of was, I don't want to, again, I'm not a psychologist, but somewhat therapeutic at this stage of, your, of your life. Absolutely. It was, um, it was therapeutic, I think, uh, to get back writing the book. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a type of guy that try not, I try not to live in the past. I have, you know, just something I try to live in the moment if you can. And, uh, when I was knew what Tammy was going through, it sort of put things in perspective a little bit more, uh, to try and sort of live in the moment. And the book for me was therapeutic, but in so closure for me, I was a typical workaholic in the, in, in the sports management field as most who are, who are very involved in ownership and pressures that come with that and management. And the book was somewhat closure for me. It, it sort of, uh, you know, it sealed up my whole career as a player and in management. And 
sort of allowed me to finish a project that was close to me because of my daughter's inspiration, but also, you know, it was close to me because it gave me a chance to reflect back for one last time on my career as it was and, and uh, the, the good times and the bad times and good decisions and bad decisions, but also bring an end to that. And uh, I think I did that. And, uh, and so I try to move forward now as Tammy wanted me and my wife to do, and that's live every day as if it's our last, enjoy every day. And, and that's somehow what's uh, we're finding strength in, in, in knowing what she wanted and trying our very best, uh, even though it's very difficult at times to live our life that way. So yes, it was therapeutic, but it was also closure for me. Absolutely. That's very interesting. And in this book, it's very, at some points, you know, we, we're going to kind of start out in your junior career, but prior to that, you touch upon a lot of your life experience as a youngster, and it's very raw, it's it's very honest, and I think people will find that to be extremely interesting as well. Very human, too. It's just you know, basically some of the challenges you had, family wives and things of that nature uh, in your youth, but you do end up becoming a goaltender because you have an older brother who likes to shoot the puck. So um, <laughs> eventually you have you're, you're gain quite a bit of skill at it, and you play for no less than the Peterborough Peets of the Ontario Hockey Association. Your coach is uh, another highly recognized individual through hockey who obviously is no longer with us, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit or get your thoughts a little bit on Roger Nielsen, your impressions of him when you were uh, playing junior hockey. Well, Roger at that time, um, I think as much as anything else for me in some ways was a, a bit of a father figure. Um, you know, I had a, it was a little of a rocky childhood, I guess. My dad had some drinking problems, alcoholic, and, you know, we drifted it apart at times, and at times he would show up and support uh, support me the best he could. But Roger was, he was an outstanding hockey coach, as far as I'm concerned, way ahead of his time with some of the... Uh, almost radical things he would do, uh, which I've outlined a couple of them in the book, but there are others as well. Uh, but he was a, a strong coach, very demanding of, of all the players that they attended school. Uh, you couldn't miss school no matter if you got home from a road trip at three or four in the morning, which would happen once in a while. You had to be in school. Roger was also a school teacher in addition to his coaching with Peter Peets and uh, was an outstanding coach, a, a, a father figure, a mentor in some ways. And, he kept me on the straight and straight and arrow, straight and arrow for uh, sometimes when I needed it probably, and uh, reminded me that uh, getting my education, at least in high school, was important. Uh, there were times I wanted to drift away from it, but he wouldn't allow that if you wanted to play for him. So, I think at that time in my life, uh, you know, I left home when I was 15 to play in the Western Ontario Junior B League in Chatham, and then went from there right to two years with Peter Peterborough Peets, an uh, extremely well-run organization. Um, and having a coach like Roger at the time in my life was important, not only from a hockey standpoint, because I think he gave me a chance to become a pretty good goaltender, uh, at least good enough to get drafted, but also sort of kept an eye on me in some other ways as well. You had no shortage of talent on that team. Rick McLeish, Craig Ramsey, Ron Stackhouse, Ron Plum. The team is, is strong. You're well coached, and you eventually get drafted, as you noted, number 39 overall by the Los Angeles Kings. And I was curious about your first training camp experience. Uh, what was your impression of the playing with NHL hockey players, and how did that first camp go? Well, back, and you're talking way back in 69, and so things were different for rookies then uh, than, they, than they are now, that's for sure. And, you know, I was one of the one of the rookies on the team, along with Butchie Goring and uh, Greg Boddy, and a, 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 a fellow went on for a decent career, Dale Hoganson. And, you know, you sort of had to know your place. Uh, you were going into Los Angeles Kings training camp with uh, guys like Gary Desjardins, who was an outstanding goaltender, and Bill Cowboy Flett, and... Oh, Soupy Campbell and a lot of the guys who had had some NHL time and were, you know, had uh, I mean, it's somewhat of a name for themselves. So you sort of, you had to go delicately and uh, watch what you say and remember you were a rookie and uh, behave yourself. And uh, But it was also extremely competitive because even though I was a draft choice and uh, I went into training camp with, with no contract and had to, had to earn a contract. And thankfully, I had a, a very, very good training camp probably if I had to pick one stretch in my entire career where I played extremely well, it was my first training camp with the uh, with the LA Kings, and 
you know, as the book alludes to, I was getting some accolades for my play in camp and they wanted to keep me and send me to LA right away, but that didn't work out. But, uh, so it was, it was, a it was a, a fun time, but it was also a serious time. And cause you had to, you were competing and always looking over your shoulder and I wanted to earn a contract. I had nothing to fall back on. I had, actually was offered a full scholarship at St. Lawrence University, but opted to turn pro instead uh, because my family needed the money, to be honest with you. So it was a, a decision I made, and then training camp was tough, but it was uh, it was uh, my first experience at pro life, and uh, it was a, an eye-opener in some ways, believe me. Your first year is Springfield 69-70. Uh, you've got an interesting group of of veteran hockey players, uh, the Gord Labossiers, Noel Price, our old friend Mike Corrigan, of course, is there. And as you noted uh, earlier, Butch Goring, who had a tremendous success in, in a, uh, a partial season there, Jean Putban, we could go on and on. That first season, I, I believe in the book, it notes that uh, you were injured relatively early on in, in, in the season. Is that the case? Well, not no, not actually, Mark. The first year, no, that was my second year. The the, the my first year, I actually uh, played. Uh, was pretty healthy most of the year. The odd injury here and there, but I played. I don't know, forty games or something, forty two mm-hmm. games. And uh, we, you know, we went to the Calder Cup Finals. And uh, you know, as I there's a story in the book about how. I played, I was number one goaltender pretty much all year. Bob Stedden was my backup. And then we, Jimmy Anderson had taken over as coach from Johnny Wilson. And we got into the playoffs and put Bob in time beating out the Hershey Bears. And then uh, I played around. Uh, we had to beat the Montreal team in Montreal uh, to get a chance to go to the finals. And I played probably the, one of the best games I ever played in my life. I think we won the game 3 2 in Montreal, which is a hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. But. And we were going to open up a four-game series against Buffalo, which was in the HL at that time, or best of seven series, rather, against Buffalo. And even though I'd been the number one goaltender all year and had played the crucial game to beat Montreal in Montreal, I didn't get one look against the Buffalo. And it was something that, to this day, probably still bothers me a little bit as to why the coach never gave me a chance. And uh, I'm sure he had his reasons. I'm not sure what they were. I never did ask him. Uh, I guess I just buried it and said, okay, he's the coach. Ask questions. You did what the coach told you to do, but it sort of was perplexing as why he wouldn't give me a chance uh, against Buffalo in the playoffs. It's one of those things. It's such a dynamic career to have. And I guess we all go through it in life where decisions are made that are out of your control in many cases. This is one always perplexing something you probably faced a million times throughout your your career. You can't control what other people are thinking. You don't exactly know. Naturally, you're going to take it personally. But nonetheless, the team goes to finals. You had a strong year. The next year that I alluded to, 1771, a, a year in which the Kings kind of labored through a, a lot of the season and with, with Coach Johnny Wilson and ended up winning it all. However, you sat out a lot of uh, the season playing just 15 games. That was the year, you, I believe, you had a shoulder injury, and right. it really was a setback for you in your career. Can you talk a little bit about that? It must have been frustrating to have to uh, kind of just sit out for that st- stretch, you know, only your second pro year while the team is uh, is moving on to, into the playoffs. Well, that whole second season started right in training camp where I went downhill, uh, where I got smashed up my thumb really bad in training camp and probably should have just taken time off. But again, I was, uh, you know, you're always fighting for your job and I'd been the number one the first year and I wanted to be the number one the second year if, if I was going to get sent to Springfield. And there was a young goal who the Kings had drafted and the mate uh, the second year and Billy was struggling a little bit in camp, and uh, I was I was got off to an okay start, but then I smashed up my thumb, and rather than taking time off, I just had the trainer just pad up my catching hand with uh, as, as best he could and tape my thumb, and Billy was just batting pucks down. I really couldn't play. I didn't have a very good training camp, but I got better, and I got sent to camp, and or excuse me, got sent to Springfield my second year, and was again to be the starting goaltender, and Billy, who had struggled in camp, but was. Um, and I think that opportunity was supposed to go up and play for the Kings against Boston and dislocated my shoulder in the game against the Hershey Bears and sat out for a few weeks and uh, came back probably sooner than I should have. Again, uh, the pressures back then for me were to 
get back playing as quickly as I could because I, I, I didn't want Smitty to take over the number one job. And, and he had played okay during my absence at that time. Not great, but played okay. And mm-hmm. then, but they did give me the number one job back and I got on a, a roll again and a couple of, and then again got hurt. And uh, that was pretty much the end of my season. And Billy uh, went on to become not only number one goaltender, but outstanding in the playoffs. They won the Calder Cup, and I was on the sidelines and uh, could have been happier for the team. I tried to be a good teammate through through it all, but you still wonder if you would have won, had we would have won the Cup if I was in that. So I never would have known that. But Billy, uh, you know, deservedly went on to an outstanding career, a hockey a Hall of Famer. And uh, when I did see Smitty a few years ago, I jokingly told him if I hadn't got hurt, he would never have become an NHL <laughs> Hall of Famer. So. He was a good guy, and he played well, and the team went on to success. So that was sort of what wrapped up my second year pretty quickly. Yeah, the uh, what I remembered, and I, I kind of mangled it in, in when, I, when I asked you the question, but what I remembered is the fact that you were poised to play for the L.A. Kings in the Boston Garden, uh, at least be on the, on, the, on, on the roster for that night, and the untimely injury, which seemed to, uh, again, be a series of, uh, of bad fortune in that stretch of time. But nonetheless... Persevere through 71-72 season, have a strong year with, with the Kings. And then there's a formation of a new league, the World Hockey Association, and you're contacted by Jack Kelly. I'm curious about your thought process at that point. Uh, WHA gave an opportunity to a lot of guys like yourself uh, who were in the American Hockey League and had big league talent. How did Jack get a hold of you, and what was your thought process? I'm assuming there was a, a bump up in pay as well. Well, I, I remember it. Clear, some things I forget, but some things I remember clearly. And I just, we were a bunch of players were staying in the room in, in the old Coliseum in West Springfield there. And we heard rumors of the WHA starting, and players have already been contacted. And uh, I didn't know where, whether I was going to be contacted or not, but I did get a call from Jack, and uh, he told me about the WHA. And, you know, and at that time, I sort of knew my career with the LA Kings was probably coming to an end. Uh, they had, they had, they had actually, I had actually traded my rights, or I shouldn't say traded my rights, the Montreal Canadiens actually picked up my rights after my third Kings. And I wasn't sure what was going to happen. And Jack contacted me and told me about the WHA and the New England Whalers and how they had uh, selected me. And he wanted to talk to me about a contract. And, uh, you know, I, at that time, there was a, a player agents were coming out of the woodwork uh, because this new league was being formed. And I got contacted by... Uh, by a lawyer slash agent who wanted to represent me as he said he was representing a few other players in the league and Mm -hmm. I'd never had an agent before and I figured well it was this new league and uh, maybe it was time so I agreed to allow Charles Abrahamson to handle my contract negotiations and I arranged to meet with Jack uh, the following the season after the third season was over and I was sort of technically I quote unquote a free agent I guess I met with Jack up in Ottawa along with another player Terry Caffrey who was up there at the same time and no, literally at the same time literally the same time same room same hotel room same contracts being negotiated at the same time which I found a little bit strange but <laughs> um, you know it, it happened and uh, I got a contract from Jack and you know I was making oh, I don't know nine thousand dollars or something my third year with the with the Kings and HL or the WHA, Jack offered me a cut for $25,000, and uh, it was sort of a take it or leave it. There wasn't a lot of negotiation by Mr. Abrahamson, as they found out later on. But, you know, 9000 to 25000 and not sure what my future ha- held. And, and, you know, being married and family, I had, had to make a decision. So, you know, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, I think I say that in the book, or if I don't, I say it as publicly as I can. I signed with the Whalers and uh, and just enjoyed five great years uh, with the Whalers. Not always great on the for me, but an opportunity to be with a great group of people, a great organization, and uh, I could never say enough about the Whalers and the way I was treated with them. In the topsy-turvy world of the World Hockey Association, the Whalers were always one of the more stable, well-run, and secure franchises. And going to that first year where you're a key member of the team and a key part of the 1973 Evco Cup Championship, your goaltending tandem mate is Al Smith, an extremely interesting human being and outstanding goaltender. Talk a little bit about Al Smith. 
Well, Smitty was the perfect, uh, he was a battler. I mean, he was tough. He was a competitor. Uh, it was sort of win or nothing else for Smitty. He took losses hard. He was, he was a very, very talented. He was very good to me, very supportive. When I got the chance to play, my nickname obviously with the, with the Whalers was Batesy. And whenever I got a chance, he was the first one to, to congratulate me if I had a good game. And, you know, and he, being, being a goaltender, if he had a bad game, he knew what the right things to say, or maybe not to say anything at the, at the right time. And, I, I love playing behind Smitty and watching him play and knowing he was. And the other thing is I knew when Smitty played, the chances of me going in during the game were slim because it didn't matter how many goals. <laughs> if he had a horrible game, Smitty wouldn't come out of the game unless, you know, he, unless it was drastic. And I, I don't even remember. I can't even remember any nights where Smitty got yanked and I went in because he wanted to finish any game no matter how good or bad he was. You know, he was, he was, it was a shame he passed away far too, far too young. And, uh, you know, he was a teammate by all the guys on the team. A, a funny guy, too. Some stories and things of you know, Smitty were, were classic, but uh, a good teammate. It must have been interesting the dynamic of having a U.S. college coach with five or six U.S. college players with Canadians at the time was pretty unprecedented. Talk a little bit about the chemistry of the team. Obviously, I've I've kind of been in a loop with that group somewhat, and the camaraderie exists to this day. But talk a little bit about how that team came together and the camaraderie that helped lead that team to a championship. Well, I think, first of all, credit so much credit has to go to Jack Kelly and Ron Ryan and Jackie Furr and how Baldwin were started at the top of, of the way they put the team together because – you had a mix of some guys like myself, you know, a couple guys like myself and Ronnie Earl and guys who were just sort of uh, AHL or type guys who came in, you know, into the WHA and with the Whalers. But they had the they had the experience of guys like Teddy Green and and Tommy Williams and Jim Dory and Ricky Lee and Brad Selwood who had, who had played for the Toronto Maple Leafs and really really concentrate on their defense with, you know, Paul Hurley was a big shot college there. And, and like I said, Ricky Lee and Brad Selwood and Jimmy Dory, who all had NHL experience, Teddy Green, obviously the Boston Bruins. So they really had a very strong, uh, strong defense and a, and a, and a great goaltender in Smitty. And then, you know, he had some hot shot college kids, you know, coming out of college, Timmy Sheehy and Jake Danby. So there was a really good mix and uh, it was a close team. There weren't a, weren't a lot of changes during the year of of guys getting down with injuries or guys coming in being called up because there wasn't a lot at that time. So it really wasn't that big of a feeder system for the WHA. So that team stuck together for the most part pretty much all year long and uh, came together strong as a team. We, we knew how to play on the ice, but we knew how to party as well. And, <laughs> And uh, when you have certain guys, in the, and Larry Plo, I can't forget my Larry Plo, who, was, who had played in the Montreal system, a good, great teammate, great leader. Uh, so you had really strong leadership, strong coach in Jack Kelly, demanding but fair. And uh, it was just the whole mix of the team was the, the perfect chemistry, both on the ice and off the ice. Everybody seemed to get along. Like I said, we we hung as a team pretty closely, and, and it led to success on the ice and winning a championship that year. And double benefit for you is you get a chance to stay in the area, didn't have to uh, do anything drastic. I was curious about your impressions of the WHA in general. You were fortunate you end up with probably the premier franchise in the league at that point. But what was the league like? Did it meet your expectations? Was better or worse? Uh, what was your thought of year one World Hockey Association? Well, it take at times, I guess, the best way to put it. I mean, there were some tremendously talented players in the league, not just on our team, but spread throughout the league. Um, some guys who had had great success in the American Hockey League who never didn't think they'd ever make it to the National Hockey League, so jumped to the WHA and had great years, great success. And, uh, you know, so you had... But as far as around the league, there were, you know, teams that were really strong in Winnipeg with, the you know, the European flavor they had. Of course, Bobby Hall, when he was there... Think of some really strong teams, and then you'd go into cities that were weak and they weren't run as good. And that's when I think that's when all the stories started about bounce checks and mm -hmm. uh, problems with you know, arenas and problems with ownership and management. Uh, we were lucky, as you said, Mark. We were in a strong, strong group of people, strong ownership. Uh, so we we weren't we only knew about it from what we we're hearing from other players around the league, but. 
it was it was good hockey. It was high scoring. It was colorful. It was physical at times. Uh, I mean, who can forget that famous brawl with <laughs> with uh, Minnesota that year that I was actually a part of. Yes. Uh, you know, but it was very, a very. It was physical hockey. It was entertaining hockey. They were, uh, they weren't afraid to try some different things to try, try to make the game more exciting. So it was a lot of fun. And I think that's when I look back on my five years of Whalers. It was a lot of fun. It was competitive, and you, you know, you were paid to be a professional athlete. But it was a heck of a lot of fun as well. And uh, but there were some colorful guys around the league at that time. That's for sure. You know, and everybody whoever followed the WHA or heard all the stories about the Derek Sanderson's of the world and the things that happened in Philadelphia with the ice. And there's, there's countless stories have been documented, documented by many authors and writers about the WHA, but I have nothing but fond memories and uh, any of the things that happened for the most part, we, we weren't real close to it. Other than what, like I said, what we were hearing from other players. Yeah, there was, uh, I think Harry Neal always said that the, the league, Maybe it wasn't as good as WHA people said it was, but it was nowhere near as bad as, you know, the detractors said it was. It was uh, definitely Major League Hockey. And speaking of that, the first time I saw the Whalers in Hartford, you were in goal, uh, but you were playing against against the Winnipeg Jets at that time with hedberg Nilsson Hull that you alluded to, and Whalers came out in the short end of it. And what I always remember is Bobby Hull coming down the left side and just winding up, putting the head down, and uh, firing a puck past Bruce Landon for one of the goals in the in the game. It was 1975. <laughs> you were not alone in that, uh, that, that of course, but I was so impressed. I, I loved the whole Hartford atmosphere. The team had moved, as you know, Boston, Springfield, and Hartford. What was it like coming into Hartford at that time? It was. Uh, it seems like the fans really embraced the team right away. They really did, and even though you know they had an HL team up the road, 30, 30 40 minutes up the road, uh, there are a lot of new fans that followed too much of the hockey. And, and when the Whalers came in, they sort of took the city by storm. And again, uh, I think and credit again to ownership. It was well run, well organized, well promoted. Crowds were great. Crowds were noisy. Uh, crowds would give you. Uh, I remember my very first game. I, I think I stopped a shot that came from the red line that a few we could have stopped, and it was almost like you had a standing ovation. <laughs> so, I think I, I think it was new to some fans, and you know they're not all fans. Uh, certainly, a lot of fans were were good hockey fans as well. But it was the crowd really got into it. And the thing about Hartford, darn, darn it all, they embraced that team from the get go, and. Uh, from the WHA days, they embraced it, and obviously, and in, in later on, when the NHL days, until unfortunately they left. But you know, the the thing I remember a lot about is that even if you had a bad game, which I had my share down there, you just didn't feel the animosity from the crowd too much. I mean, they uh, they seemed to really appreciate the fact you were trying your best and. Uh, I think they really enjoyed the hockey, and, the, and I think is most of all they enjoyed having a pro team in their in their own arena. Mm-hmm. The one thing you did bring up, you brought up, a, uh, reminded me of an almost traumatic event in my early career. I was working for the Hartford Whalers. We had an intern, and we used to bring up to the sky. The, uh, the, I don't want to say the skybox, the, the, the radio booths way up in the rafters uh, in, in Hartford. And so we would bring up soda between periods. So this intern walked up the stairs with a, a ring of soda, six sodas, swinging her arms. And as she got to the top step, she swung her arm, and one of the cans broke loose and just flipped almost like in slow motion off that and into the crowd. Now, it happened to be an exhibition game, and the thing just plunged harmlessly into some empty seats. You remind me of that in the book, though, with your story. In <laughs> in Cleveland, we have a near-death experience uh, playing the C- Cleveland Crusaders. It, it could only happen to me. I mean, <laughs> it, it was uh, it was one of the strangest things. It was where, I think it was, it was a Richfield bio, I think it was, where they mm-hmm. had this beautiful huge building and uh we were playing we were playing cleveland and jerry beavers was was with cleveland but he wasn't playing that night uh bob rooster Witten was in goal at the other end and and i remember this like it was yesterday the uh, it was a, a huge cavernous arena and the 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 play had just left our our end and i had been sort of down in goalie crouch if you will or stance and just as the play left our end i sort of straightened up to relax a bit and a can of Coke came plummeting down and literally right in front of me and took out 
a huge chunk of ice uh, to the point where we had to stop the game and get the repairs done. And it was literally six inches in front of my head as it came down. And back in those days, I wore a mask, but I didn't wear a helmet uh, or even much of an attachment on the back. And, you know, what had happened, there was a worker who was way the hell up in the rafters who was doing something during the game, of all things, and had a can of Coke next to him, and he knocked it over. And uh, the thought of that, you know, can of Coke, what it did to the ice, I can only imagine what it would have done to my head and it hit me in the top of the head. So, uh, you know, I could see the headlines now, landing killed by Coke. And so, uh, but it was, uh, it, it happened. And, you know, it was one of the many things that happen, you know, when you have a career in hockey. And I'm not the only one, but that one stands out for some reason. I guess, I guess there's a reason for it. Well, it so. is a uh, near-death experience, as I say. It's, uh, it just made me maybe queasy just thinking about it because I can see that happening. I can, I'm surprised it didn't happen more often. In fact, we, we were, I, my boss, Phil Langan, when I was in Hartford, and I, I just said we have to ban cans and things like that upstairs. We ended up doing that just because I couldn't stand the thought. I had one, one little move to the left or the right, you're going to knock this thing into a, a crowd of people. But nonetheless, in 76, 77, uh, you, you, first of all, 75, 76, talking about uh, the the Whalers, you the team kind of again struggles a little bit through the season, but catches fire late in the year and into the playoffs. And I believe you get injured again early in the playoffs after a strong start, right. the, the, the defeating Cleveland in round one. And the team went on to have uh, some success with Cap Raider after that. But again, it's an opportunity where uh, you're. This happened to you a couple times in your career where you're kind of on the precipice of something special for yourself personally, and you get short circuited by some bad luck. This was an injury is my memory correct on that right yeah yeah you're exactly right and, and as you mentioned it, it the injury as i look back at my career the injuries always seem to come at you know, opportune times i mean uh, and i had my share of them but that was uh we were playing a game and i memory serves right i think it was against indianapolis um and I tore my sort of half tore my or strained my Achilles tendon very badly with a point where you couldn't even put any pressure on it. It wasn't torn, but it was anybody's had an Achilles tendon injury, they know how painful it could be. And being a goaltender, you just you couldn't put any weight on it. So I was done. I was that was pretty much the end of it for me. And Capper, another great guy, good guy who would have always sort of battled to try and win my job and fortunately for me and maybe not for him, I was sort of able to hold him back most right. years in the challenge and of course, he, he uh, Capper was a great guy, and he went in and played and played extremely well. As he did also, you know, one of the highlights of his career was probably getting the chance to play against the Russians when they came into the Hartford that one year, and he played mm-hmm. very well as well. Cap, good guy, went on to a good career, coach, scout, everything else. But uh, yeah, there was another injury that sort of put me on the sidelines at a, at a tough time. It just you know it, it seemed as when I was writing the book, and I didn't talk about all the injuries I had, but it does seem that the injuries always came at a time when I was sort of given the, given the opportunity to play and sort of, you know, being a backup for most of my life with the, well, all my life with the Whalers, you, you relish that opportunity to get a chance to, to play and play more than one game. And it seemed every time I'd get on a bit of a roll, I'd get sidelined by an injury. Going to 76, 77, the Whalers, you start to recover from the injury. It's and you're, 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 you spend some time with Island. You have a, a great story about that. We'll save that for the book. Your, your uh, ability to go from Springfield to Providence and be on time and uh, get to where you had to, had to get to. Well, that, that's a good story in the book. There's so many good stories in the book. I could be here for uh, about five hours. But nonetheless, in 76-77, you have your best statistical season in your uh, pro career. 3.17 goals against average for a Whalers team that was struggling somewhat that year. Um, the year ends. What happens when the year is over? Do you I, that decision you make at that point that you don't want to continue your career? Uh, what what unfolds in '77? Well, I had uh, we had finished up. I guess it had been five years, and it did not appear. In fact, I think if I remember right, I think I was told by Jack or by the Whalers that they were not going to offer me a contract. And uh, you know, I was at a bit of a crossroads in my life at that time. I mean, I was I was lucky enough through my whole career to be able to live in a home here in West Springfield. And I was at a crossroads. Uh, I'm not sure whether I wanted to keep playing because the injuries had been piling up. And, uh, you know, I had a young family, married young family, responsibilities. And I, one thing I never wanted to be, Mark, was a was a hockey gypsy. I didn't want to be 
traveling from one city to another, and I was lucky my whole career pretty much to stay in one place mm-hmm. as far as my roots here in West Springfield. And and uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, and uh, out of the blue, I got a call from an attorney by the name of George Leary, who owned the AHL team here in Springfield at the time, and he gave me an opportunity. He offered me a chance to uh, to play for him in the upcoming season that would have been the 77-78 season, but during the summer, he said, I'll put you to work right away. You can come into the office and do some summer sales work for me. And and then as soon as the summer off season's over, you can get ready, come to training camp, and be my number one goaltender because he was signing players at that time. And, mm-hmm. you know, it seemed like a good opportunity to sort of dabble a little bit in sales and do something different. And I needed I needed some summer work as anyways because I'd been doing a little bit of construction most, most of the other years. And so I had a chance to play for the 77 season right here in my backyard in the American Hockey League in Springfield. And I, so I, I signed the contract with George and, uh, you know, and that sort of gave me a chance to get into a whole, another whole phase of my, my hockey career. That's for sure. You talk, my wife always says everything happens for a reason. So everything that's happened so far has led you back to Springfield and embarking on what would become a momentous, uh, long stretch of, of time for you. And that last year you played 77, 78. Quick question about actually some pretty good players on that team and, and, and a pretty good team. One guy I wanted to ask you about was Charlie Simmer, who would go on to become one of the most prolific scorers yeah. in the National Hockey League in the 1980s. Uh, back then, however, he was a Springfield Indian. Did you see the potential for him to get to the next level and succeed to the level that he reached? Well, it's interesting. Charlie, he he was a big guy, but he only wasn't overly physical uh, as far as you know. Being, he was certainly capable of it, but he was he wasn't wasn't a great skater. But he had a good touch around the net. He could score goals. And it, a quick story about Charlie that I didn't put in the book is that I after I had got hurt again, hurt in December of '77, and to, to an injury that ended my career, and I went right in, right into the front office. Um, I Charlie got called up to the LA Kings, and I remember like this was yesterday. I drove him. So I was now working in the front office. I drove him to the airport, and he said, "I'm just going up for a cup of coffee," which was the old thing then. <laughs> and right. he said, "I'll be back soon." Well, he never returned because he became a part of the million dollar line with Dave Taylor and Marcel Dion, and he never returned to Springfield. And but I do remember that he said, "I'll be back." Just going up for a cup <laughs> of coffee, and uh, he went on to a nice career. But Charlie was. He made the most of what he had, but a big, strong guy who could score goals. And again, one of those things where luck sometimes or fate or whatever, you get yourself in that position, but then you get in line with Dion and Taylor and that, that complemented what he could do perfectly. And, you know, rather than playing three minutes a game on the fourth line. Uh, but another, right. another kind of interesting uh, player from that year, I, I just want to ask you about quickly was a player not too many people know about, but he was kind of a colorful character in my mind anyway, Pete Laframbois, who uh, I believe led the team in scoring that year. What type of a guy was Pete? Well, Pete was a happy-go-lucky guy. Mm-hmm. He was, uh, he, you know, he, he played with a bit of a flair, if you will, and uh, had a bit of flair off the ice too. But he was a, he was a, he was one of those guys who was a pretty talented guy, but unfortunately, I don't think he ever went on to – uh, I'm not sure. I should maybe look it up, but I don't think he went on to too big of an NHL career at all. But he was a uh, he was a pretty talented guy, big, strong, lanky type guy, uh, good hands. And uh, but he was a uh, you know we had that, you had to remember back in those days too. We had some carefree guys. You know it was uh, your carefree off the ice and and sometimes what they showed on the ice was the way they were off the ice. But uh, mm-hmm. Peter was a pretty talented, pretty talented guy. Bruce, as you noted, working with George Leary, you start out, um, I, don't, I guess you'd say on the ground floor, you do something that I strongly suggest to anybody getting into professional sports marketing do, and you start out selling. What is that like? You've had a career as a player. You, you said you had the off season prior in 77, but what is that like? You, you've hung it up, and now you're you know, pounding the pavement, going to the local printer, going to the local uh, restaurant, whatever, getting ads and things like that. Psychologically, if yourself making that shift and getting out there and selling without a safety net necessarily uh, for your for your living, uh, what was that like that that first couple of years? 
Well, it, it was interesting because I, I never shied away from talking. Um, you know, during, during my playing days, even way back when I was a rookie, uh, I always wanted to go out if you need somebody to be a public speaker or go to a Rory Club or a uh, sports luncheon or something, I'd be one of the first guys to do it. I, I somehow seem to enjoy that, uh, where a lot of players shy away from it. So mm-hmm. when George, basically when I read, called it quits as a player and he and he gave me a, a yellow legal pad and a pen he said okay you're in charge of group sales and averaging sales go ahead and do it so um, you know a quick story short I remember my very first sale uh, I was waiting to call on a manager marketing director of a mall here and uh, outside the other end and I was real early, as I have a tendency to be for every one of my appointments. So I happened to wander across the street to kill some time at a television place, a place called Manny TV. And that was in the 77. And Manny had just started. And somebody said, why don't you talk to Manny? He might do something. And I sold the very first ad uh, in the program, the Springfield program, to Manny, uh, who owned mm-hmm. Manny's TV and Appliances. And Manny, to this day, is still a sponsor of Springfield Hockey. Wow. And he's a friend of mine. I see him quite frequently um, around town and a member of the same country club and golf club as me. And But that was my very first sale. But I never never shied away from sales. I enjoyed it and had some success, um, you know, in the sales. I'm not afraid to say I had some success and was able to drive, drive revenue. And I think, without a doubt, uh, the ability to go out and do sales and, and sell myself and sell the, the company or the team I was working for probably was the best thing ever happened to me in my, to help me in my management career and later on my ownership, ownership days. It was just a, a experience, you know, what you need. And a lot of people, the young kids come out of college now and, and look for ideal job sports industry. But for me, it was on it's the thing in the pavement to try Try to revenue and, and always try to impress your boss that you know you can bring in revenue. You're not just an expense, and it's sort of a line I used throughout my whole <laughs> right. career. If you can, if you can generate revenue, you're just not an expense to the company. And uh, so that was sort of what started me in my my other career, if you will. Right, absolutely. And you're obviously, you know, looking way, way uh, ahead in your career. You, now you have the credibility because you never asked anybody to do do something that you never did yourself. And of course, a revenue di- driven career. I know we're going a little bit over here to over overtime here, Bruce. But it's a couple more questions for you. As you, sure. um, a week ago, I was just I consider myself to be a pretty knowledgeable person when it comes to hockey in the seventies, eighties, nineties, what have you. But I was dizzy going through all the affiliations of the Springfield Indians, all the ownerships and changes. And you look at the list of coaches, uh, it, you know, Bob Berry, Pete Stubkowski, Johnny Wilson, Orlin Curtinback, Hawkeye Webster, incredible through those years of the late 70s and early 80s when I get to those special years in the late 80s. But... For yourself, I mean, this is a real. I and I, I would say this about your your entire career. You're there was there ever a time? I mean, because you you keep adapting constantly, and I, you, you have to read the book to appreciate it. Because I I can't do it justice here. But with you know difficult owners, new owners, insecurity, instability, new affiliations, new coaches, success or lack of success in many cases on the ice. How do you personally persevere? You're working 15 hours a day to make this thing happen? Uh, were there times when you just said, hey, there's, there's got to be a better way. I, I go out, I could work eight hours a day selling insurance or whatever the heck. Was there, were there times where you just doubted this whole thing and you didn't want to stick it out in Springfield? Yeah, there, there, they were, but they weren't many. To be quite honestly, there weren't many. Um, I really loved what I did. And I found myself, and I know it's an old cliche, but... I found myself getting up every morning and looking forward to going into work. And, uh, and I enjoyed that when I was director of sales and marketing. I enjoyed it when I became general manager. And I, I certainly enjoyed it when I became president and, and part owner. I just I just loved going to work. And I loved the challenges that came with them. Unfortunately, I didn't know I'd have as many as I did for <laughs> right. my career. But, you know, you, you find a way to persevere. And, and what I think what happened, I, it's shown best in the book, is that as one year rolled into another year, I became almost fixated on making sure the team never left Springfield. I mean, it was my home. It was a team that had been good to me. Uh, hockey had been good to me and my 
Thursday, and so it became almost, you know, you had to do the, you had to, you had to fight the fight, and uh, and I had a lot of them, and you know, going through the affiliation changes is is always difficult, and you always. You know, back in those days, you were always looking to hopefully bring that right NHL affiliation in that would give you the NA, the, the championship you want or the stability you wanted. And, you know, as book world documents, we didn't have a lot of success, so we I'd make decisions, and sometimes they're bad ones. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, making affiliation changes didn't turn out. And, you know, the grass isn't always greener, as they say. But for me, it just came almost a, a personal thing that I – I just didn't want to see this team leave. And as attendance was horrible during some years there, and there was always talk of new team in the American looking to buy a franchise. And Springfield was sort of, uh, you know, one they would focus on because they were struggling in attendance. And there was talk whether the team was going to fold or team was going to get moved. And uh, it just came, came something that I just didn't want to happen on my watch that I'd never want to see this team leave Springfield. So that, result in a lot of challenges that are again explained in the book and how I had to flip ownership and do what I had to do to persevere to make sure the team didn't leave the area and and thank God at the end it all worked out and uh, you know this team is here forever and ever and so but there was there were nights when you know you'd be sitting in your office it'd be midnight and uh, you'd say there's got to be something else they want to do but I can honestly say that for me if I did have that thought goes through my my mind it didn't last very long uh, i enjoyed the challenges and i think i think probably somebody asked me not to belabor the point but asked me the other day what do i miss and i don't miss the players or i shouldn't say i don't miss the ice on ice i miss the challenges i really do miss the business challenges uh-huh. uh, that went with it even though i had more than my share uh, i think it makes you a stronger person and i know it was it, in some ways it was very good for me absolutely it says a lot from a business management leadership viewpoint about being single-minded in purpose and having a passion for what you do. You know, a lot of people would advise, you know, diversifying, you know, hey, maybe Bruce, you should have a side thing going or something like that. But you were single-minded and that you're a humble guy. You won't admit to this, but your single-minded is purpose and your passion for Springfield hockey is the reason, uh, you know, you, you, as you note in the book, a lot of people came into play who helped who put their wallet down and helped keep this thing going, including yourself. But without Bruce Landon, uh, there would not be professional or at least American Hockey League level hockey in Springfield. And I know you're too humble to uh, to concede to that. So I'll go on to the next subject, which is the um, the the years I remember very, very clearly because I was working with the Hartford Whalers and, of course, 88-89, 89-90, unprecedented, back-to-back Actually, it was uh, 89-90, 99-1, back-to-back championships, both coached by Jimmy Roberts, two different affiliations, and Whalers have the affiliation in, in Springfield after the Islanders affiliation wins it in 1990. I remember being there for that for that championship. But in 1991, uh, you win. The year before, the Binghamton franchise had been just horrendous. But the Whalers right. had a strong draft in the offseason. Uh, Kenny Schinkel, uh, Bruce Harrelson did a great job. We got some good young players. And all of a sudden, they become the affiliate and they become the championship. One thing in common, aside from being in Springfield and yourself being there, was Jim Roberts. Talk a little bit about Jimmy and, and how he was able to coax two completely different uh, teams to a championship in the AHL. Uh, it's hard to... I guess when I think back about Jimmy, uh, you talk about a tremendous, tremendous motivator. Um, eye for talent, but a motivator. And as you said, you know, we were affiliated with, I was a general manager at the time, and we were affiliated with the Islanders. And won a, won a, won a Calder Cup uh, with outstanding goaltending and a great team. And Bill Torrey, and, uh, who was the architect of the Islanders, had given us a really good team in Springfield. And we won a Calder Cup, and Jimmy was our coach that year, and, and did a phenomenal job of just of of just getting the best out of every player he had. He knew the buttons to push. He kept guys off guard all the time. Uh, they never knew what to expect. And you think you're going to be skated into the ice? He'd give you a 20 minute skate, and he'd let you go. Uh, he kept players on edge at times, but. I remember Dale Henry, a player, uh, looking me in the eye one time and saying, I hate that SOV, but I coached <laughs> for a wall for him. Right. And I think Jimmy just had a unique way of 
not not so much. Uh, he wasn't an X and O's guy by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, he had uh, he had a game plan, and he knew how to he knew how to get the most of his players, and and he had some talent to work with. And I, you know, that, obviously that's important as well. And then the following year, ownership Peter Cooney owned the team, and I was his general. Manager. The Islanders, as happens in the AHL, when you're you get pressure from your NHL affiliate that they want more money because we pay them a lot of money. And right. the owners wanted more money to stay in Springfield. And Peter wasn't prepared to pay more money. And it, it got almost at it did. It got to a, a standstill where there was no movement. And uh, we were actually at our AHL meetings in, in Bermuda. Um, you know, the pressure was on Peter and to make a decision because the rest of the HL teams wanted to get going with scheduling and everything else and Peter was holding the whole league up and we had an opportunity to sign with the Whalers but we were concerned as you said because the Whalers had had such a horrible year the previous season in Binghamton and Peter and I are trying to figure out how we're going to sell it to our fans and went from the Islanders and win a Calder Cup to NHL Whalers and won 16 games the previous year but Pressure got to Peter, and uh, I remember like it was yesterday, I was sitting on a raft in Bermuda after the meetings were over, and he swam out and jumped up and said, can we make it work? And we sat under the blazing. So that's when the decision was made to go to the Whalers, and it was a good decision because we won another Calder Cup. And Jimmy came along, was hired by the Whalers to be our coach, and again, he had some talent to work with. Uh, the Whalers really treated us well. Again, I speak so highly of the Whalers, both when I was a player and even when we were affiliated with them, they just, they treated us so, made sure we got the right players. Uh, the deadline, the NHL training deadline, they made sure they didn't hurt us. Uh, they gave us the right combination of players, great goal and in K. Whitmore. Uh, and we went on again because of Jimmy and his ability to, to find, uh, to turn over a stone and find players. You know, we brought in guys like just you wouldn't expect, but came on and strong at playoff time, won another championship and back to back championships, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty difficult to do. And back in those days in the H hour at any time, early in the H, you know, yeah, especially under those circumstances. I remember guys like Mikhail Anderson, Ivan Corvo, Terry Yake, all had strong uh, post seasons with the Indians looking ahead real quick, 1993, 94, the last year at the Indians, Joel Quenville is your coach. He is now the second winningest coach in the history of the National Hockey League. Did you see traits in him then that would lead to his success down the road? Well, well, you know, I, the obvious thing for me to say is yes, because he's had such great success. But, you know, it, Joel was very organized. I think if I go back and I, I look back in, in those days and being around him, and I was around him a lot, very organized, uh, very disciplined in his own sort of life, but disciplined in, in his coaching philosophy. Uh, and you could see signs that, you know, he he was methodical in what he did. And, uh, you know, even, even when I look at him today, if I look at him behind the bench or I'll be looking at him in Florida behind the bench uh, on TV or something, I still see that same look he had back in 394. He hasn't changed a lot. He looks great. But, uh, you know, could I say back then he was going to go on to be a tremendous NHL coach? No, but I, I liked him as a coach at that time and I thought that, you know, his approach to the game and the way he handled players and, you know, coaching a lot. And I was never a coach, uh, but coaching a lot of times is just knowing how to get the best out of players, no matter what it takes to do it, kicking the butt or, you know, patting the head. And, and I think the good ones sort of figure that out quickly. And I think Joel was able to do that. One of the most interesting parts of the of the book, and I think it's all interesting, but the the end of the Indians era, the beginning of the Springfield Falcons, uh, your role in ownership, saving the team at the eleventh hour, the Springfield Falcons go on, and you know I had been working in American Hockey League during part of this to become a, a, a financially it was a solid franchise, financially successful due to the fact that you guys were able to manage costs and take an intelligent and aggressive approach to sales. A lot goes on in that time period. It's covered in the book, but in general, I did want to talk about one person who you devote a chapter to in your book who becomes critical to this stage of your life and who was a great friend all the way through, back to your days of the Kings, Wayne Lachance. Now, a lot of our right. fans yeah. may not know a lot about Wayne, so uh, talk a little bit about Wayne and his role in the success of Springfield Hockey. Well, Wayne, uh, Wayne and I very quickly were 
teammates that I had already played a year of pro and Wayne came out of Clarkson where he was a, a very good, big, strong defenseman for Clarkson. He was a Canadian boy, Espinal, Ontario, but went to Clarkson University and and drafted by the Kings. And uh, we met up in training camp and sort of became friendly in training camp. And then we both got assigned to the field. Again, it was my, going to be my second year, his first year. And I had a car at camp, which they allowed me to have because I knew I'd give him transporta- transportation mm-hmm. to the minor leagues when I get sat down. But we were I played an exhibition game in Montreal and uh, we got both got cut at the same time. And so Wayne and I uh, drove to Springfield together and through that five hour, five, six hour trip from Montreal, we became very, very close uh, just over conversation. And I dropped him off uh, halfway down so he could visit her when he was dating. And we just came, became very good friends. We weren't really that close our first year here in Springfield. We were teammates, but uh, we lived in different areas and, and and I was seeing a lady here at the time, you know, and then she came, became my wife. We and I became very close after that. We became uh, racquetball opponents and golf partners. And his wife and my wife, we traveled together. We uh, Our families grew up together. We just became very close friends. Wayne ended up staying in the area as well after his career ended fairly quickly after a few years. And what happened was, quite honestly, is uh, Wayne heard news of uh, in '93 uh, that the team was being in the, ninth, the end of the '93 '94 season. You heard me go on TV. He was watching the local telecast and heard me say that, you know, I was going to try and keep hockey alive. The rumor was out that the team was being sold, and he called me and he just said, "What's going on?" So we met, and you know, it's well documented in the book, but. Uh, Wayne was the quiet guy of the group. I mean, I was the guy leading the charge with press conferences and and uh, running the business for the most part. Wayne was behind the scenes, uh, keeping an eye on finances, working closely with our business manager at the time. And uh, but it was Wayne who helped me put the group together in '94 to to actually get an ownership group together. And uh, Wayne sort of was behind the scenes all the time. But as I say in the book, I, I honestly believe that. You know, I get a lot of the credit. Uh, if it hadn't been for Wayne making that initial phone call, who knows what would have happened. And uh, he's now living in, uh, we end up, you know, without going too much detail, flipping the franchise a couple times, or I flipped it once uh, to get Wayne out because I sort of looked in our crystal ball and didn't like the landscape of what I saw with our expenses and revenues. Wanted Wayne to get out while the going was good because we had some really, really profitable years as owners. Right. And uh, but I looked didn't like what I saw in the landscape, so I got Wayne to agree to we agreed to sell and allowed Wayne to get out and uh, at the right time. And he's re- retired at the age of 55 and is now living full time in Jupiter, Florida. But uh, and I just talked to him two, two days ago, as a matter of fact, and he has remained a very strong friend. But again, as I had to, I couldn't you couldn't write a book about hockey in Springfield. Um, and leave him out of it because he was a big part of why uh, the Falcons uh, were able to get up and running. That's great. I, mean, I enjoyed that chapter too. I didn't know a lot about Wayne until uh, I obviously had heard of him quite a bit, but uh, didn't know a, a lot about his his role until I read the book. The book, of course, is The Puck Stops Here, My Not-So-Minor League Life, written by Bruce Landon and written well. It's an excellent book. You'll have a, a great time taking Bruce is going on a journey with Bruce through his childhood, right through his career. A lot of ups and downs, but in the end, you'll learn a lot about perseverance, grit, stick to and uh, faith in, in keeping uh, keeping something alive when the odds are stacked against it. That's what I came away with it, way, way with it from. It was a lot of fun, a lot of funny stories, but I think a lot of life lessons in there as well. So, Bruce, thank you so much again for the time today, and we'll look forward to seeing you this weekend in, in Springfield for the Springfield Heritage Weekend. Thanks very much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the voice of hockey legends. Just a reminder to please consider giving the show a rating and or review on Apple Podcasts. The link is in the show notes. These ratings and reviews help us become a lot more visible and make the show more accessible to hockey fans everywhere. I personally read all the reviews and greatly appreciate them all. If you have thoughts or suggestions for the show, you can talk to contact us through our website at prohockeyalumni.org or be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Pro Hockey Alumni. Thanks for listening.